This is CBC Here and Now. I know Dave's family seek justice. I too want justice. But justice is not punishment. These things are serious. They take a long time to get there, but it's the right decision. A mentally ill man and two families changed forever. Today, a judge decided Graham Vitch's fate. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Carolyn Stokes. And I'm Anthony Germain. It's a tragic case that both sides describe as devastating and brutal. Today, a judge found Graham Vitch not criminally responsible for killing David Collins, his mother's partner, in 2016. Mark Quinn was in court for today's decision and has this report. Judge Sandra Chater says that what happened here in December 2016 was clearly a tragedy for everyone affected. But she said Graham Vitch doesn't deserve punishment for David Collins' death. Chater said Vitch lacked the capacity to know his actions were wrong when he attacked Collins with a hammer at this home. She ruled that Vitch is not criminally responsible for Collins' death. Vitch's lawyer believes it was the right decision. So this young man has been through an ordeal, the likes of which few of us ever will be, and he has been through that ordeal in the context of developing and having schizophrenia, which is something which in and of itself is an ordeal. So it's, it's, I can't comprehend it. It's, it's, it broke my heart to watch. Fitch's mother was in court to hear the decision. Outside, her lawyer, Lynn Moore, read a statement that Joan Vitch wrote. It began with words for the Collins family. I am deeply and sincerely sorry for all the anguish you have endured because of Graham's illness and my failure to recognize the extent of his illness before it was too late. I know how your worlds have been saddened and forever changed since Dave's untimely death and my own life will never be the same. Vitch has been held in custody at Her Majesty's Penitentiary for most of the last 30 months. But today's decision doesn't mean he's free to go now. Vitch has been placed under supervision at the Waterford Hospital, where a review board will decide when he's ready to be released. Technically in a state of indefinite incarceration until the review board says, this is how we're going to go about this. Vitch's mother hasn't been allowed to speak with him since the night of Colin's death, something she's been fighting for more than two years. Today, Chater ruled that Vitch may have contact with her son again. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Well, the Premier is telling his side of the Ed Martin story. The sudden CEO changeover at Nalcor in 2016 came up at the Muskrat Falls inquiry. And here now is Katie Breen was there and she joins us live from our newsroom. So Katie, let's start at the beginning. What did the Premier have to say? Well, the moment that Ball became Premier in 2015, he started having issues with Nalcor. Ball testified Nalcor left out key information about rising costs when they first briefed him. To get a better handle on things, Ball ordered an independent review of the project. He said Nalcor was reluctant to share information. And the Premier says then-CEO Ed Martin essentially gave him an ultimatum. Support him and Muskrat Falls or he'd walk. I made it quite clear that I was not going to be uh, the cheerleader that he was expecting me to be for him or, or for Nalcor at this point, that we did have some serious issues that we need to work through and that we agreed that, that he would, uh, that would step down as CEO of Nalcor the following, the following morning. That's when Ball hired a new CEO, triggering a $1.4 million severance for Martin. Once Stan Marshall was in charge, Ball said that communications improved, but it's still not perfect. For example, Nalcor, dro Nalcor dropped the ball on methylmercury mitigation. Nalcor was game to cap wetlands. Ball says he wanted to do it too, but it didn't happen. Nalcor asked the Department of Municipal Affairs and Environment for the go-ahead last year. The province didn't approve the request until this year, and that was too late. Ball says it wasn't a delaying tactic and that methylmercury levels weren't as high as anticipated. That doesn't explain why it wasn't approved in 2018. Why the permit wasn't approved? Correct. Absolutely, it doesn't explain that. It's increasing frustrating for me when I find out that we could not do wetland capping uh, simply because that, that permit uh, was not approved. So Ball was called to the inquiry that 
he called. He's gotten some criticism for not having it after the project was completed, but he stands behind his decision saying that it's going to provide valuable information for the province's future. Live in the newsroom, I'm Katie Breen for Here and Now. That big area of low pressure that we've been talking about for the past couple of days still very much in place and keeping things cool for uh, most of the island. We only reached uh, the teens today in some places, not even 12 degrees for St. John's Bonavista, 10 for Twillingate. And we do have that heat, but it's up through Labrador, 25 degrees in Lab City right now. Uh, now we are seeing some showers move through the Avalon thanks to that low pressure system. That's going to continue as we head through the night tonight, but the heat is on the way and I'll have all those details coming up. Thanks, Ashley. Some reaction from Eastern Health after a story that we brought you last night about Teresa Power and what was said during my conversation with her son. Well, Henry Power praised the doctors and staff at the emergency room at, at the Health Sciences Center, but he said he would like to see something done about what he called a gap. Now, after a fall, his 92-year-old mother was diagnosed with several forms of cancer, but she couldn't go directly into palliative care. And Henry says their choices were to leave his mom on a gurney in emergency or bring her home. In a statement late this afternoon, Eastern Health says that a palliative care approach is initiated when the client is ready in consultation with a healthcare professional and that once it is determined that palliative care is appropriate, Eastern Health arranges for palliative care follow-up once the client is discharged. And there are also some in-home palliative care options that are also available. Ocean Choice International showed off its almost completed vessel with a state-of-the-art processing factory on board. The new ship will create jobs and allow OCI to process product at sea and deliver it to market. The company invested $3.5 million and was given a repayable contribution of $3.5 million from the federal government. OCI hired a Babel's company, C&W Industrial Fabrication, to build it by first building the factory and then the vessel around it. Blaine Sullivan of Ocean Choice International says the newest addition to the company will be named Calvert and could create as many as 70 jobs at sea. It's interesting when you can take everything and, and build it just the way you want it rather than have to compromise. So give us an opportunity to um, you know, not only to do the factory way to want, but we also built the ship as very energy efficient, and we looked at uh, you know it's built to um, a green ship designation. It's been five months since grocery stores in the Twillingate area pitched their plastic bags, and the owner of Stuckless Fresh Mart says so far there haven't been any snags. CBC's Jane Eighty spoke with him about this transition. Would you say it has been a relatively painless transition? Uh, in my case, it has been, yeah, it's been really painless, um, a little surprising uh, because it's plastic bags have been around for years and, and to switch now to none and have to remember to bring your bags, uh, thought it might be a bigger challenge, but no, it's been good. I bet there are probably other um, store owners in other communities in Newfoundland and Labrador considering this. I think it is the way it's going to go. Seems to be the way, yes. Yeah. yeah. Would you have any advice to give to uh, other owners that might be considering going bag free? Uh, well, I think one of the things that uh, we are, I feel that uh, was a big help was the fact that we had the support of a lot of uh, other groups, uh, Department of Fisheries for one, uh, donated quite a few bags to pass out for free. And after they were gone, then the uh, Local Alliance Club, uh, Crime Stoppers, the Kinsmans, uh, they also provide the bags to pass it to customers uh, free of charge. So the customers didn't have to spend any money on up front. Okay, so I guess over the past few months they've been able to accumulate their own collection of reusable bags that they bring yeah. in with them. Well, most people then, they, they probably have eight or ten bags of their own then and uh, we still have bags they can buy. Uh, but they keep so many in their cars, and uh, if they come in and we say, well, do you have your bag? Oh, sorry, I left it in the car. And they say, I'll just flick it in the car now and get my bags, and everybody is happy. So. What's the, have you had any comments from customers who say either, you know, way to go, thanks for doing this, or 
questions about why he did it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, they, they think it's a great idea. Uh, they see on the news and different areas of problems with plastic and problems in the ocean, and they just want to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. So, and everybody do a little small bit, and, and it can result into a major cleanup. Would you recommend it to other uh, communities? I would, yeah. I would recommend the other communities that would want to do it. Uh, if they could find some sources to uh, contribute bags to them to pass it to their customers, I think would be a great way to start uh, to get people into doing it. And uh, if they have success like we do, there will be no issues. Clean off the glasses many, many times today <laughs> when I had it out. Very misty. It yeah. would start and stop and start and stop. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks to that low pressure system, it is not moving. It's just stalled there. Essentially, yeah. That's what it's, uh, you know, slowly moving out and it will. Mm -hmm. Off you go. Yeah, off yeah. you go. It's time yeah. to move along. Yeah. Hazy shade of summer. Yeah. Is yes. For all the Bengals fans out there. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways. No idea what you're talking about. Yeah. But Before your time. <laughs> But yeah, those temperatures a little cooler again today. If we take a look at them, uh, only sitting uh, at 12 degrees this afternoon for St. John's, 15 for Deer Lake. And then we do have 20 degree temperatures, uh, mid 20s up through Lab City and uh, Churchill Falls sitting at uh, 24 this afternoon. I haven't really moved much as far as those temperatures go. 
And as we head through the night tonight, we are uh, looking at that chance of showers and we're seeing that on radar uh, with all of that cloud cover the mentioned yesterday, uh, the sunshine down through the southern half of the province and that's certainly happening this afternoon. And there goes uh, those showers. Now we could see that potential for some more as we head through the night tonight, especially up through the northern peninsula, anywhere really along the northeast coast, looking at that uh, chance showers and then clearing skies slowly uh, as uh, we head a little bit further east as that low continues to track further offshore. Uh, but then another system up through Labrador is going to bring in some of that cloud cover through the overnight. So here's a look at the temperatures. Uh, six degrees is the cool spot down through Port Vast, same up through St. Anthony. Otherwise, we're looking at between 8 to 12 degrees for central and eastern Newfoundland. Northwesterlies, though, still around 10 to 20 uh, kilometers per hour overnight. Again, with that chance of showers anywhere along the northeast coast. As we head up through Labrador, four degrees for Nain. Still cool for, I mean, rather warm for Lab City, only going down to 15 degrees as your overnight low tonight. Still have that risk of thunderstorms in play. Now, it looks like right now they're a little bit north or south of you, but still that risk as we head through the night tonight. Tomorrow as well, you can uh, see that potential for some thunderstorms through the afternoon as a little bit of a disturbance moves through again, but that low will move further and further offshore, which should clear those skies starting uh, in the southwest and then heading towards the east. Some lingering drizzle though and cooler temperatures continuing along the northeast coast for everywhere else. We're looking at temperatures quite warm. So here's a look uh, at what we're expecting. 15 degrees for Clarenville. There's those warmer temperatures starting to move in. Marystown should reach a high near 21 degrees tomorrow afternoon. Otherwise, again, uh, 12 degrees and cool for uh, St. John's Bonavista 11. And then as we uh, head towards central, there's where we start to get into some of those warmer temperatures. But still, again, that chance of some showers in the first half of the day, then some clearing. So 20 degrees for Grand Falls, Windsor, uh, 23 for Port of Bass, Burgio as well. 22 degrees up through Gross Morn, Sunshine and 21. And then for the Northern Peninsula, uh, again, anywhere along that northeast coast, looking at those cooler temperatures, gray skies and then some lingering drizzle through the day. Mary's Harbor should reach a high near 17 and Cartwright near 16. And then again, that potential for some thunderstorms. Have it in for Churchill Falls as well at 25 degrees. Lab City, same thing. Those winds out of the southwest, uh, somewhere between 20 to 40 kilometers per hour. And then Nain still in those single digits, but plenty of sunshine and 16 for Makovic. So those warmer temperatures are starting to move in. They're going to push further east across the island as we head towards the weekend. It looks like it's going to be pretty warm. I'll have all those details coming up. Thanks, Ashley. So just as we had in the weather, <laughs> you said lazy shade. You said hazy shade of summer. Yeah, the winter. The, the but yeah, a play on hazy and shade of winter. Yeah. And I referenced the bangles, the and bangles. I stand corrected now. Yeah. No, no, well, I just, I just I was like, <laughs> Ashley was kind of looking at you like the bangles, and I was looking at the bangles. I thought it was Simon and Garfunkel. I'm thinking the generational <laughs> changes on the set. So no bangles. Uh? Yeah, you Simon think and, yeah. Simon and Garfunkel? I think bangles, and Ashley has no idea yeah. what we're talking and about. And then I say Simon and Garfunkel to Ashley, and she thinks it's a law firm. So you know, we're even. <laughs> Anyhow, back okay, to summer. Yes, uh, to summer. while summer is trying to push through here on the Avalon Peninsula, many parents are on the lookout for outdoor activities that cater to the younger crowd. Mm -hmm. Salmonier Nature Park, great place, and that might be the place for you. Wildlife rehabilitation means that visitors can go there and see the creatures uh, nice and close up. Yes, but spotting them isn't as easy as you might think. Ariana Calland and cameraman Daryl Murphy swung by to uh, get some tips. Hi, my name is Chris Baldwin, and I'm the manager of Salmon and Nature Park. As you walk the boardwalk, it's a good idea to take your time and, and not to make too much noise. But if there's a lot of talking, sometimes the animals are a little less likely to, to kind of show themselves. We're here at the Canada Lynx enclosure. One really important tip here is you know, to just be a little patient. The lynx here tend to be at the back of the enclosure, so keep an eye out for the back of the enclosure. You might just see them. Tip number three, oftentimes it's better to come here on a little bit overcast days. On hot sunny days, animals tend to find shelter and to get away from the sun. We don't allow pets, and sometimes folks come here with a, a dog or a cat, and that can be a little bit uh, of a problem, I guess, here on the trail. 
Uh, there are occasions, of course, when someone comes with a uh, service animal, which is uh, understandable. Maybe the lynx sometimes, uh, maybe the fox. We have a new spruce grouse on okay. display here, so it might be a bit difficult to see the spruce grouse. Tip number five, learn about wildlife. And there's lots of opportunities to explore you know, information about wildlife. If you come to the park, of course, our staff are fully informed about the different species that we have here and how they interact. A pair of binoculars, a camera with a zoom lens maybe, especially if you're going to take photos. So the zoom lens helps you kind of zoom in on areas in the, in the enclosures to, to look for or spot some of the animals. And last but not least, uh, come here often. Uh, the more you come here, the more opportunities you'll have to, to see the different species that are here in the enclosures. And, and not just in the enclosures, but the whole park, of course, is, uh, is a place where there's lots of different wildlife. You know, there's over 80 species of bird life. Joey, come on, Joey. Come on. Come on, big boy. Come on. Over the last 18 months in this province, we've had one worker fall to his death from a rooftop, another killed in a paving accident, and that's just the fatalities, not the injuries. Stay tuned. A bit of safety that's set up for tomorrow. That's coming up.
Welcome back to Here and Now. It's summer, very busy time for the construction industry and a good time to talk about safety and there's a special event planned for that tomorrow. Jackie Manuel joins me now to talk about that. So Jackie, what is in the works for tomorrow? Tomorrow we'll be hosting, uh, organizing our second annual construction safety stand down. So uh, we started this last year. We started off our construction season last year. It was terrible. I don't know if you remember, but we had a number of tragic accidents. Uh, and so we just really wanted to highlight the importance of workplace safety. So tomorrow we're also uh, inviting uh, employers and workers to stop, um, take a break from work for a short time and talk about health and safety with their workers. Right, so is this, is this tools down for the day or how do companies do this? Because obviously they're in business for a reason. It's whatever's going to work for that company. Some companies plan uh, you know, a, a lengthy activity, some just do a short uh, tailgate meeting in the morning. Uh, at the NLCSA, for example, we did a fire drill yesterday uh, as part of our stand down and we had a guest speaker today talk to us about fatigue. But in construction, routine for companies to start their day with a safety talk. And so we'd just like them to, everyone, we have about a, uh, more than 50 organizations registered. Uh, we figure close to about 4,000 workers will participate. So when you think about tomorrow, more than 4,000 workers are going to stop and have a conversation about safety. I think that's uh, that's uh, astounding. Right. So I guess the idea here is to try to make safety uh, top of mind at a very busy time in the construction period. You mentioned that uh, in the last 18 months we've had some difficulties. There was a person who fell to his death in downtown St. John's. We've had person recently killed in a paving accident and there have been other incidents what do you hope people take away from something like this so that those kinds of things won't happen so awareness is huge I mean I you know whether it's one whether it's 20 I mean uh, nobody gets up and goes to work um, and plans to have an accident that day. So and I just mentioned the deaths, so not not you know the injuries uh, that we don't necessarily hear about. Well, in actual fact, in 2018, um, there were five fatal accidents, or with three fatal accidents, and two uh, workers that died of occupational disease. But there were another three, close to 300 workers that were injured severely enough that they couldn't go back to work. And that's just the construction industry. So tomorrow is a chance to stop. Um, reassess think about what are the hazards here in my workplace am I doing as an employer or as a worker everything that I can do uh, to make sure that uh, we work safe every day now it's possible somebody's watching us right now and they're thinking well I'm not part of this yet is it too late absolutely not no and it's open to any organization it's not just construction companies participating we have a lot of municipalities on board this year so any organization or company that's out there that would like to get involved they can just go to our website and that's nlcsa.com and register and this year um, every worker that uh, participates in the stand down will have an opportunity for free training we're giving away our uh, online construction worker safety course uh, free to everyone who participates a prize for registering listen uh, good luck with it and thank you very much thank you very much much for your interest. Well, if your dog is eating grain free, you should know it may not be as healthy as you think. The American Food and Drug Administration has released a list of 16 pet food brands that could be linked to deadly heart disease. Two of those brands are connected to a Canadian company. Castrusi has more. For Maggie, dinner time can't come soon enough. She wastes no time gobbling up the kibble. But the Labradoodle is oblivious to the ongoing investigation by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. The agency is looking into a potential link between some dog foods labeled grain-free and a rare canine heart disease. Fielding tons of phone calls about it. This vet is hearing from anxious owners. It's a lot of people just terrified of what they're feeding their dog. Uh, am I killing my dog? Do we need to test my dog for anything? Canada's Champion Pet Foods manufacture two of the brands on the FDA list. A statement posted on Champion's website says it is misleading for the FDA to post the names of brands, while at the same time fully stating they have no scientific evidence linking diet to dilated canine cardiomyopathy. The Canadian government doesn't regulate pet food, leaving that up to the industry. The only regulation it does have is with labeling. You can put anything in a bag and call it dog food, um, as long as your manufacturer name and contact details are on the bag. Alex Richardson feeds his dog, Rocket, grain-free meals, and so far, he hasn't run into any health issues. In fact, like uh, the food that they gave us from the OSPC area where we adopted them yeah. um, 
we switched it out because it was full of grains and stuff and we thought we were doing, you know, the good thing. You're perfect. You're perfect, little lady. Vets say these days owners want their pets to eat the way they do. A lot of people trends will end up moving over into the animal uh, world. So all the low carb diets are like, oh, if it's good for me, it's got to be good for my dog. But ultimately, what is good for your dog, he says, is a balanced diet full of protein and carbs. Cass Roussey, CBC News, Toronto. Well, staying with food, but for the uh, less cute, there are concerns about the environment in the city of Halifax, and it has that city cracking down on drive throughs There are already restrictions in the downtown core, but now council there wants the city to expand those restrictions to the suburbs. Now, the idea here is to reduce greenhouse gases that are emitted from cars that are idling. Shana Luck with that story. It's a popular option for those looking to eat and make a quick getaway. But a Halifax councillor says the city should be moving away from allowing more businesses to serve customers in idling cars and discouraging what he calls car culture. I, I worry about the future. I worry about where we're going without some action right now. This is only the beginning of a process that everybody's got an opinion on. For convenience, right? Because it's fast and easy to get in and out, right? You're not waiting in the lineups inside. But I do turn off my car when I'm in the drive through if there's a lineup. We're heading off and we are trying to make the ferry in time to get to PEI. So, uh, like right now, we're kind of in a crunch, but try not to use it if I can't. But again, guilty sometimes I do. Uh, if you're a business that's open like 24 hours or something like that, and you have to run a limited staff for like those hours, it makes more sense just because then you can have people come right through the drive thru and have two or three people working it. Existing drive throughs would be allowed to stay, but if council decided to move ahead on this issue, it could put restrictions on building new ones or expanding old ones. The community that I've heard from the most is the disability community. This councillor says people who have a harder time getting in and out of cars are worried about where the drive through restrictions could go. Yes, we have a car culture. Yes, we have to get off the car culture. Uh, but at the same time, we have to recognize that uh, not all of our residents are, uh, have uh, the same ability. Richard Zarowski says he's willing to look at the pros and cons, but he thinks it's worth staff's time to examine how to implement the idea. In any change, you get those that say, well, this is a great idea, and you get those that say, well, it's going to inconvenience me, it's a difficult idea to implement, and there are certain shortcomings with that. Shana Lux, CBC News, Halifax. Well. That wouldn't go over very well here. I can't imagine that there'd be too much uh, support for getting tough on the drive throughs mm -hmm. are very popular here. Yeah. Yeah. But, but some of the newer cars, they, they actually shut down as soon as you stop and then start back so up no again. Idling? So no idling? No yeah. idling, yeah, so. Okay, my 1937 Edsel uh, doesn't have that feature. <laughs> I'll have to get to work on that. <laughs> A little quiet oasis in the middle of a city. It seems to be an unlikely location, but a campground is being developed right off Topsail Road in Mount Pearl. For the owner, it's more than just a business, and we'll tell you about that next.
Well, when you think of Topsail Road in Mount Pearl, the last thing you probably think of is peaceful tranquility. But just a few hundred feet this way, and you're in the woods. 16 acres of pure wilderness being turned into a campground, but the owner of this land says it's about more than just business. Preserve it from being a pipe yard or a parking lot. Uh, my parents ran their family business on this site from about 1970 and I grew up here. So this was my childhood playground and it's my parents' livelihood and uh, labor of love over a 50 year period. Uh, and now we see it as an opportunity to do our bit for climate change and preserve it for future. So the, this phase of the park is actually on industrial development land. It's zoned mixed development. Uh, so we can build a park, but we could also uh, develop the land and put an office building and parking. Mm -hmm. So this is the way we wanted to go. And why did you want to go this way? What gave you the idea to turn this into a campground? Inspiration, really, walking my beagles through Pippi Park. Um, in 2017, I was walking the dogs through uh, the campground there and realized that we had as beautiful a piece of property and equally wilderness in the middle of Mount Pearl instead of the middle of St. John's. So I started sketching out some ideas and came up with this project. And I floated it by my parents who were still uh, going concerns at the ages of 85 and 87. Um, they were very enthusiastic. What do people say to you when you say to them, that you're constructing a campground right off Topsail Road. <laughs> they say, what? what? Where? <laughs> That's what I said. <laughs> That's what everybody says. But what people don't realize is we've got this 16 acre site, 14 acres is gonna be the campground itself. It runs right to the trailway so you can ride your bike over a future bridge and you're in the Powers Pond Park so there's a total of 140 acres of cycling and walking trails and you won't cross a road. It's a beautiful piece of property both on this side of the river and that side of the river. We could just pave the thing. Um, yeah, wouldn't it make more it. business sense to, you know, sell off chunks of this land? You're right next to an industrial park. Surely there would be businesses that would pay good money for, for bits of this land. Wouldn't that make more business sense? In 2014, we had that uh, approach to the land development and in fact we had a developer that signed a letter of intent and at the time the price of oil dropped mm -hmm. so the project went away it was going to be a multi-story office building and uh, where our existing warehouse is and the rest of the land was going to be parking so it was literally a case of um, paving paradise and putting up a parking lot at the time, I was really disappointed because that was going to be a really easy out for our family. Since 2017, I'm immensely relieved that uh, it didn't happen because this is not the best economic choice for the property. I'm sure we get a better margin by selling it, but we will get a positive margin by developing the campground. and people can enjoy the playground that I had over the years. So uh, yeah, it's not the best business decision, but it is the best decision for our community. Sounds like you're pretty proud of it. I, I think our family is very proud of it. And uh, uh, I heard a story some time ago about a forest fire broke out and a hummingbird picked up a beak full of water and dropped it on the fire. And a, a beaver said, what are you doing? That's not gonna make a difference. And the hummingbird says, well, every little bit helps. I think this is our little bit. All right, Dan Walker, thank you so much. Uh, you're very welcome. A little story there. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually what he said, though, was uh, interesting because you think of Pippi Park, and I know the place is packed, mm -hmm. and the, you know, the parkway is not so far from Pippi Park. No, this will be competition for Pippi Park. Yeah, yeah lots of sure. space, lots of room. And they open up, uh, they're scheduled to open anyways, uh, in September, just in time for Labor Day weekend. Yep. Busy time. Mm -hmm. All right, let's get to international news now. The United States, Donald Trump is under fire once again, and it's for his 4th of July celebration. As reported last night, the U.S. president plans to command the stage at the Lincoln Memorial in Washington this evening, and he's doing it with a show of military muscle as a backdrop, and that's not going over well with Mr. Trump's critics. 
Uh, you know, I think we need money to go into affordable housing. I think we need money uh, to go into rebuilding our infrastructure. I'm not quite sure that we need money to go in to put tanks uh, in downtown uh, Washington, D.C. It's not just Bernie Sanders. Other Democrats are calling the so-called Salute to America program self-serving, unpatriotic, and wasteful. But some Trump supporters say they welcome his stamp on the holiday. The event will pay tribute to America's military power. Now, the cost has yet to be disclosed. And here at home, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is defending his judicial appointment system. It's come under renewed fire since the CBC reported on ties between New Brunswick Liberal Dominic LeBlanc and recent appointees to the provincial bench. Olivia Stavanovic has the story. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says he stands by the recent judicial appointments in New Brunswick following criticism that five of the six have connections to Liberal Cabinet Minister Dominic LeBlanc. They include a family member, a neighbour and friends of LeBlanc. Some are donors to the Liberal Party, LeBlanc's riding association and his political campaign. Critics call this a conflict of interest, but Trudeau is not reviewing the appointment process. We are pleased that we have uh, nominated uh, top-notch judges right across the country and we will continue to. Instead, Trudeau says he is confident in his reform system to make nominations more independent. We are fully confident that the process, the transparent merit-based process that we've put in place uh, is the right one and we stand by it. But critics say the appointment process is not working as intended. They point to the fact that LeBlanc only recused himself from discussions over the nomination of a family member, not the other four appointees who have ties with the minister. The accountability advocacy group Democracy Watch has filed a complaint with the Ethics and Conflict of Interest Commissioner. The appearance of integrity of judges is very, very important. It's fundamental to having a democracy and a rule of law, and so that's why we can't allow this appearance to be tainted in any way. Democracy Watch is calling for an investigation and a suspension of all judicial and watchdog positions until the entire appointment system is reviewed. Olivia Stefanovich, CBC News, Ottawa. Okay, we need to start making it for ourselves, like our, on our own. A revitalization of the mom and pop store. Next, meet the husband and wife duo behind Curry Delight.
Welcome back to Here Now. A volcanic eruption has killed one person and smothered a popular Italian tourist destination with ash. The eruption sparked a number of fires on the island of Stromboli. The person killed is believed to be a tourist who was hit by falling rocks from that eruption. And several water bombers had to be called in to battle the flames as well as to protect coastal villages. So uh, a little bit of a wet day. Mm -hmm. uh, I know it's Thursday, short week because of Canada Day. Yeah. People already thinking about the future. Yes. The weekend. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you like heat? Yes. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, you're in for some heat. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Definitely, I think summer is here, which is nice. Uh, temperatures are going to warm up tomorrow already. We're going to start to see that, but uh, really going to ramp up as we head into to sun, uh, Saturday. So that's certainly good news there. All that mild air is going to move across the Maritimes, move towards the island. Uh, we're going to see it up through Labrador as well, at least through the first, uh, or at least tomorrow and then into Saturday. And then with that, we're going to see some cloud cover, though, and unsettled up through Labrador through the afternoon on Saturday. And then as the cold front sweeps through, we're going to start to see that uh, the uh, precipitation move towards the island overnight and into Sunday morning. But uh, as I mentioned, that heat temperatures very much in the 20 degree range. It's going to feel quite humid as well. Feeling closer to the 30 degree mark uh, without the humidity for Grand Falls, Windsor through parts of Central. But add that humidity in likely closer to 32, 33 degrees is what it's going to feel like with plenty of sunshine. That shower activity moving in overnight Saturday into Sunday up through Labrador, uh, even along the coast. So really for like places like Twillingate, you're going to see temperatures in the 20s as well. Uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay looking at rain and 23 degrees. Still going to stay cool up through northern uh, Labrador, though. Nain only reaching a high near 6 degrees. And then a little cooler for Lab City as that uh, center of that low pressure system moves in, only reaching a high near 18. But still uh, quite nice for this time of year for your Saturday. So there's a look at that low pressure system. The cold front will eventually sweep through on Sunday. So some cloud cover. It looks like it'll move quite quickly through the afternoon. We should see some clearing skies again, maybe hanging on to some of that cloud cover for parts of the Avalon, but those winds are going to pick up. So we're looking at a, a brisk day somewhere between 30, maybe even 40 kilometer per hour winds. Clearing skies into Monday looks absolutely gorgeous. Not the case up through Labrador as that low sits over you. So it's going to stay unsettled through the day on Monday, even into Tuesday. As that low drifts a little bit further south, we're going to start to see some more cloud cover for uh, the island, but we're going to hang on to some of these temperatures. So here's a look at uh, what we're expecting over the next five days. Stay with those cool temperatures tomorrow, but there is an end in sight uh, Saturday and Sunday, both in the 20 degree range for St. John's and Eastern Newfoundland. But again, keep in mind it will be a little bit windy by the time Sunday rolls around and you're looking at that potential for showers, but not until the overnight for Saturday and into the beginning of Sunday and then clearing skies. Monday and Tuesday looking nice as well. 19 and 21 degrees as your afternoon highs. For central Newfoundland, uh, that rain will continue, or at least the chance of rain will continue through the weekend. Again, uh, not going to anticipating it won't happen the whole day because you will still see some peaks of sun. 29 degrees for your Saturday with humid air as well. And then Sunday 22 and you're going to stay in that range as we head towards uh, Tuesday as well with that chance of showers. Western Newfoundland, 20 degrees tomorrow, 26 on Saturday, and then uh, we'll eventually start to see a cool down by the time Tuesday rolls around as that low moves in. And then up through uh, Eastern Labrador, 21 tomorrow, and then cooling off into the teens for uh, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday again, thanks to that low pressure system. And we're looking at the same thing for Western Labrador, looking at that potential for some thunderstorms, though, tomorrow. So let's look at your forecast. I'll have your weather photo coming up. Thanks, Ashley. Well, a couple in Mount Pearl is reinventing the concept of the mom and pop store. It's the husband and wife duo behind Curry Delight. They've grown their business while juggling kids and day jobs, but they've also grown deeper roots in their adopted community. Here and now, Zach Audi has more. I'm gonna need more spinach there. Okay. While most people are finishing up at work for the day, and wondering what to have for dinner, Nasser Mohammed and Afia Altaf are working at their second jobs, cooking dinner at their new restaurant. Mm, perfect. Altaf and Mohammed run Curry Delight, 
for years. Their food has been a hit at the St. John's Farmer's Market, but this year they made the leap to a place of their own. And we use like, you know, top quality ingredients in our food. It's made from scratch, organic stuff, you know. We pour our hearts into what we do. We make everything with so much care and love that you can like, I would say you that you can, you can taste it. <laughs> Born in Karachi, Pakistan, the couple came to St. John's as students at Memorial University, but they found themselves missing the taste of home. Our community food, like uh, specific to our area and like the community that we belong to, it's it's different. Like it's got a lot more, like I'd say flavor, a lot more flavor and uh, the combinations with the spices and stuff like that. We, we tried a lot of places, but it, it just, we ended up doing like, okay, we need to start making it for ourselves, like our, on our own. They started cooking for friends, then for parties, then set up a table at the farmer's market. At the same time, the couple finished school, got jobs in the local tech industry, and had two children. They had a lot of hot pots on the stove. It was getting crazy at the market. We were so busy, and then we were renting our kitchens, and like, you know, it's a nightmare with the schedule and everything. So we really needed our own space. The answer? a new twist on the mom and pop store. They found a restaurant in Mount Pearl that had been an old general store with a family area upstairs. Now they had space to cook and look after the kids. It took two years to renovate, decorate, and set up shop, but the work was worth it. Like, of course, it's a lot to do and we are exhausted as well, like, but the response, like, just watching people try the food and just, just smile, or the little sparkle in their eye the second they have their first the bite. Sparkle. <laughs> a few hours later, the food is ready and they're open for business. One man orders an old favorite. <laughs> Can go around for a chicken? Yeah, try the sample of the salad. The man tries something new instead. Oh my God, this is amazing. <laughs> oh my God. And there's that sparkle. I was going to try the butter chicken, but he gave me some of the masala chicken. And it's spicy. If you like spicy at all, that's the stuff to go for, is, is the gear. Muhammad and Altaf are keeping their day jobs, expanding the hours at Curry Delight, all while raising a family in their adopted community. And with their new mom and pop store, they found a way to bring their labors of love together under one roof. Food is the most common thing in, in, in humanity. It goes across races, different regions. Even though we are coming from different parts of the world, different point of views or whatever, but we can all enjoy good food. Zach Gowdy, CBC News, Mount Pearl. Yeah, it's that time on here now where they torture us <laughs> yes. uh, with the food towards the end. Well, that looks fantastic. Yeah, suddenly have a hankering for butter chicken. Yeah, that, that's that expression in Karachi, Pakistan. A lot of people don't know, but the good food, it's the gear. The gear. Yeah, there you go. Starving now. <laughs> Take a look at this weather photo for the day today. Calm, very beautiful. <laughs> I want to be out there on a boat. I don't know about you guys. Good reflection. <laughs> yes. There's no way you can tell where this photo is taken, but uh, I will tell you who took it when we come back. With the Simpsons theme in my it head. It does. That's what I always think of when I see those clouds. <laughs> Simpsons clouds.
Welcome back. So for about a year, a team of Egyptian archaeologists has been gearing up to reveal what they found inside a 4,000-year-old pyramid. Yeah, and of course for archaeologists, that's a lot of excitement, and today was the big day. Amorites, scarabs, shells, chains, catens, which is still in perfect condition of preservation. Wow, the pieces are made of ivory, copper, bronze, and crystal. Most will be moved to collections in Egyptian museums. And inside the pyramid, there was the burial chamber of the pharaoh uh, who built it, who had it built. And the team found uh, sarcophagi and very colorful painted masks, as you saw. Wow, the site itself is about 60 kilometers south of Cairo, had been closed to the public since its discovery. Always so amazing when you think wow. about how long, 4,000 years. Incredible. Yep. How it stays intact like that. Yeah. No, when it's not touched, amazing. yeah. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is a lovely picture. It is. It's just a, a little bit of a calm day. Nice day to be out on the water, certainly. You can see some showers there in the background uh, from those clouds, as we mentioned, the uh, oh. Simpsons clouds. Simpsons, now, is that yes. what they taught you in meteorology yes. school? <laughs> it is a, and it's an Ashley. actual term. No, it's not an actual term. <laughs> uh, you're going to have to help me with that because I have no idea how to Shibagamo? pronounce it. Shabagamo? Shabagamo. There you go, Shabagamo Lake in so Lapua. that's what it is now. That's what uh, it is now. Nice. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I don't know, we had Sherry any Gallant. pictures from there before? No, I don't think so, and I forgot to ask how to pronounce that. That's okay. <laughs> but yeah, it's a perfect day out on the water. Great day to be out fishing or doing whatever you want. Enjoying the sunshine. Uh, thank you so much for sending that in, Sherry. And uh, if you have any weather photos that you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Mm -hmm. And Sherry, let us know if there, what kind of fish are in that body yeah, of water. Yeah, I'd be curious to know. There's a few places in the big land. It would yeah. be fun to go and wet a line that looks like a nice spot. Mm -hmm. Definitely does. Might be and a trout or two in food there. Food fishery coming up this weekend again. Oh, that's right. Oh, yeah. yeah, now to the ocean, of course. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so and it looks like a nice weekend. A little windy, though. But it oh, does really? look, well, Saturday night into Sunday. But yeah, it okay. does look like a nice weekend. Mm, it's hot. And you get the very latest weather if you're planning on fishing. I know certain parts of the island there were not a lot of fish around. I, you mentioned Twilling Gate, there were there were quite a bit. Was it Twilling Gate or Trinity? Uh, uh, Trinity. I saw some pictures yeah. from Trinity. Lots of fish there. Mm -hmm. right, and whales. And whales. Yeah, minky whale. The whales are a good sign. Back too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and they'll be Thanks. here soon. Yeah. All People right. coming in. Talking about fish. Talking about curry. It's time <laughs> to go eat. Dinner. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. Good night.